Welcome to the Winter Term Lecture, Parallel Programming with OpenMP and MPI. My name is Georg Hager. First of all, who is this lecture for? The typical audience are all scientists and students who have to deal with numerical algorithms and uh, the implementation on computer hardware on a daily basis. So it's for physicists, chemists, computer scientists, mathematicians, material scientists, everyone who needs more computing power than what a laptop and PC can provide, and who wants to learn more about parallel programming from desktop to supercomputers. A little bit about myself. My name is Georg Hager. I'm actually working at uh, Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen Nürnberg. Um, I am an associate lecturer at the University of Greifswald at the Institute of Physics. I did my PhD in 2005 in Greifswald and got my habilitation in 2014 also in Greifswald. If you want to contact me, you can use my email address, but uh, the preferred way to contact me is actually the Moodle forum. I've set up um, a discussion forum, which is free for everyone, in the Moodle course, so please use this link to get all the material also for the lecture that you may need. Slides, videos, Q&A summaries, exercises and solutions will be there. The course will be conducted as a two-hour, 90-minute-per-week lecture. I will publish a lecture video every Monday in Moodle. There will be one exercise sheet every week. You don't have to hand in any uh, solutions. It's totally up to you whether you want to do the exercises or not. The Q&A live session, which is every week, will be used to discuss um, your questions, any questions that you may have, and also solutions to the exercises. And I will also discuss uh, next week's exercises in this live Q&A session. So if you have any questions that can't be handled in the forum or by directly contacting me, or if you have any questions that you think your fellow students may also find interesting, please come to the Q&A and ask them there. The envision time slot for the Q&A session was Tuesday 3 p.m., but um, I gathered that not everybody was happy with that, so I set up a poll to find a better slot. So please consult the link in the Moodle to see that. There are some prerequisites that you need in order to follow the lecture and especially the exercises. Um, you need some C, C++ or Fortran programming experience. All examples will be in simple C or Fortran. Even if there's one or the other Fortran example and you're only a C programmer, don't worry. The codes are typically very simple and easy to understand, even if it's a, f a language that you're not familiar with. In order to do the exercises, you need to be uh, familiar with handling a Linux command line and using remote access via Secure Shell. If you're on a Windows PC and you're not, you don't have any Windows SSH client, I recommend Mobile Xterm. Uh, you can use it on your PC without actually installing anything. There's a mobile version too, and it includes an SSH client and an X server. So essentially everything you need to um, access a remote system via Secure Shell. You also need to be able to handle a compiler on the command line. You will get accounts for accessing the HPC clusters at Erlangen University at the local computing center, RZE. Um, this will be done in one of the next uh, Q&A sessions. If you're not so familiar with Linux and you need to get a refresher, please consult this Linux tutorial I found on the web. I think it's quite instructive and, and easy to swallow. Of course, there's a lot of literature around about parallel programming. There happens to be a book written by uh, myself and a colleague of mine, Introduction to High Performance Computing for Scientists and Engineers. There should be some copies in the Grafswald University Library. I'm not quite sure, but I'm almost sure. There's also documentation about MPI and OpenMP, the topics which we'll cover mostly in this lecture, in these two, on these two websites. There you can also download the current standards in which the MPI and OpenMP programming models are actually defined. However, be aware that these standards are very heavy documents. They read more like, uh, like legal documents and they're not good for learning this stuff. So uh, actually you should be pretty self-contained with this lecture. Um, if you have any specific questions, you can go to the standards or to the book, but you shouldn't have to strictly. The top500.org website, which we'll come to later, again, is also a, a good um, source of information for current HPC systems and, and trends. So please uh, take a look there. 
So here's an outline of what I plan to do in this winter term. First I'll give you an introduction to the basics of parallel computer architecture, up to a point where you can understand the basic issues and bottlenecks we deal with when we do parallel computing. Uh, the second chapter is about parallel computing itself, especially about the uh, notion of that notion that parallelism is limited and it's not possible to speed up a program by an arbitrary amount. There are some models and it turns out we can use models to our advantage and to understand better the behavior of parallel programs and I'll do a little bit of that in this section. Then I go into shared memory programming with OpenMP. Shared memory means that OpenMP is only useful if your parallel computer is a shared memory computer, meaning all process all processors uh, access a single big shared memory. There will be a chapter about OpenMP performance issues. It will address questions like why does my code not scale or behave performance-wise as it should be. Then comes the introduction to the message passing interface. MPI is a library definition that um, allows you to address really huge systems, systems which are uh, which comprise nodes that are coupled via high-performance networks. And um, if you want to use a supercomputer at any scale, you need to learn MPI. There's a chapter about advanced MPI. MPI is a very, very big standard. So there's no way I can cover it here in all detail. But I try to make a distinction between basic and advanced MPI. Um, you will be able to solve all problems that can be solved with MPI, also with the basic stuff. But the advanced functions give you more flexibility and maybe also more performance in some cases. And then I'll show you something about MPI performance issues. Just like in OpenMP, there are some do's and don'ts that you should keep in mind when dealing with MPI. And finally, there is the option of combining MPI and OpenMP into a single programming model, uh, which is, seems especially attractive uh, with the kind of hardware in, uh, that we have today in supercomputers, and uh, this will be the concluding, concluding chapter. If you take home one thing from this lecture, it will hopefully be a good grasp of the potentials and performance issues of parallel computing in computational science. So even if you don't remember the exact interfaces, the, the calling conventions, and the way it's actually done, um, what you should take home is what are the limitations of parallel computing, what are the basic bottlenecks, and what can I expect from a parallel program. There might be some prior knowledge among you about supercomputing and its applications, but nevertheless I would like to give a short survey, uh, necessarily incomplete, about applications that supercomputers um, are used for. Uh, first of all, one thing that everybody knows is weather and climate prediction. There's a huge amount of computing power used every day to uh, compute tomorrow's weather, and it's it's pretty successful, I would say. Um, drug design, um, new medications, for example, especially in the current situation, a lot of cycles are spent uh, designing or trying to design um, vaccines or drugs that help against the pandemic. Um, the simulation of biochemical reactions is a big topic actually at the University of Erlangen. A major part of our compute cycles at our supercomputers is spent with molecular dynamics codes and um, ab initio uh, quantum uh, simulation codes that try to figure out reactions between complex molecules. Processing analysis for measurement data, for example, by uh, detectors or um, by measurement devices in orbit uh, is a very big topic also here in Erlangen. Uh, the properties of condensed matter, there's the chair of complex quantum systems where I did my PhD, um, and those guys were one of the major users of compute cycles also for some years in German supercomputing centers. The fundamental interaction and structure of matter, like for example lattice QCD to explore the fundamental structure of matter that requires a lot of computer power, fluid simulation, structure analysis, fluid structure interaction, and also mechanical properties of materials can be studied using simulations nowadays. Let's not forget entertainment, rendering of 3D images at movies. I think in 1997 Titanic was the first movie in which the CGI scenes were rendered on a Linux uh, cluster system. Um, nuclear explosions, of course. The American Department of Defense 
is running uh, a couple of the fastest supercomputers in the world and also medical image reconstruction whenever you get a ct or an mrt there's some high performance hardware involved that converts the raw measurement data from from your x-ray detectors and the mrt device to an actual image that the uh, the doctor can look at and many many more of course so whenever there's an application on a computer, there's usually a numerical algorithm behind it. At least we restrict ourselves here to numerical algorithms in computational science. Now, it turns out that in computational science, there are many standard algorithms that keep appearing wherever you look. If you look at diverse fields, there's a couple of things that you keep encountering. And a couple of years ago, there was a, a famous paper by uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, The Landscape of Parallel Computing Research. And in chapter three, they stated that most of computational science codes comprise one of these seven, one or more of these seven uh, basic families or basic motifs of computing. They call them seven dwarfs. Now, um, in the meantime, they extended that to 14 and included more non-numerical algorithms. But actually those seven are really a good coverage of the, um, of the dominant part of computational science. Dense linear algebra, so dealing with matrices or multidimensional structures. Sparse linear algebra, matrices in which most entries are zero. Spectral methods, um, so Fourier transformations, for example, to solve uh, differential equations. And body methods, structured grids, unstructured grids, and Monte Carlo methods. So it turns out that the larger part of these dwarfs will be covered by some of the examples I will show you in this lecture. So you will get your share of the dwarfs. Now, what is parallel computing? Parallel computing means that we find a way to map a numerical algorithm to the hardware of a parallel computer. Now, here we have a very simple numerical algorithm, the multiplication of a dense matrix or some matrix with a vector, which yields another vector. This seems simple enough, but it turns out that this seemingly simple operation has a surprisingly rich phenomenology in terms of performance, and we'll also um, discover some of that in the lecture. Now, parallel computer can mean a lot of things, and I've chosen here the two ends of the spectrum. Parallel computer could be your cell phone, it could also be your laptop. Nowadays, every laptop is a parallel computer with at least two or four cores. And you could have a supercomputer with thousands or hundreds of thousands of cores. And this, this algorithm can run in parallel in all of these systems. So it's our task in this lecture to find out how to do that and how to do that fast and effective. And as you will also learn, doing something fast and doing something effectively may not be the same thing in parallel computing. So where is this parallelism in modern computers? Where is the problem with parallel computing? Why is it so difficult? Now it's difficult because parallel computers nowadays have a very hierarchical structure with layers upon layers of hardware units that you have to know and address when doing parallel computing. Now we start with the place where the actual work is being done. If you multiply a matrix with a vector, somebody must do the multiplications and the accumulations. Somebody must do the work, the arithmetic. And this is done in the executional units of each computational core. So there's one core, it has execution units. They could do signal and double precision, uh, multiply, add, subtract, divide, and other things. There are registers, which are fast places to hold data and there may be multiple levels of cache in which the hardware keeps often used data for future reference. Now this is a, what we usually call a core and this is the basic unit a uh, computer is made of. Now several of such cores are typically put onto a die or a chip. Nowadays in the commodity server market and in HPC um, we have up to 64 cores on such a chip or a socket. And um, these are usually put together, not by themselves, but also using a shared L3 cache um, by which those cores can communicate with each other. Now that's not enough, um, but it is the basic unit of which all computers are comprised. So we have this chip, it has a couple of billion transistors nowadays, and of course it needs some infrastructure to run, for example, a memory interface, memory dim, some I.O. And this infrastructure we call a node. In high performance computing, the 
Price Performance Sweet Spot is usually a node with two such chips, or as we call them, sockets. The socket or the package is the thing you buy in the shop. If you go to the shop and you buy the latest Core i9, 99, whatever, Intel processor, you get a package, or as we call it, a socket. You can attach on the motherboard memory to the socket, there's some other infrastructure, and as I said, in high performance computing, typically there are two sockets on the board, which comprises then a full so called node. It's called a node because one OS, one operating system instance, is running on such a node. Now, here's a picture typical node in a high performance computer. They're quite space efficient, actually. You see here it's, uh, it's very flat. Um, we have the two CPUs with their uh, cooling. Um, infrastructure. The memory dims are at the side. There are some fans, of course, to blow cool air through the system and some other things like network infrastructure. It's this part of the structure that you address when you do OpenMP programming. OpenMP cannot leave the node level because it requires shared memory and that's what we have on this level. If more compute power is required, we have to put together many of such nodes using a high performance network. And this is then called a parallel computer or supercomputer. We have many nodes that are connected using a high performance network and of course you need some storage because usually uh, in high performance computers there are no or no, only very small hard disks uh, used on the nodes. A hard disk is a major point of failure and the fewer hard disks you have in your system the better. So in our systems at the University of Erlangen we do not have any local hard disks in the nodes of our big systems. Now, if you want to know who owns or who runs the fastest supercomputers in the world, there's one place to go to. It's the top 500 list, top500.org. Uh, they do a ranking of supercomputers worldwide using a well-defined benchmark that's called LINPACK. LINPACK solves a dense system of linear equations. AX equals B solves this for X. The size of the system to solve is unspecified. So in practice, to get best performance, you fill the nodes of your supercomputer with as much data as possible, which means you make the matrix, the dimension of the system, large enough so that almost all the memory is filled and you can show mathematically that in this limit um, the communication overhead between the parts of your system plays a minimum role. So then this um, limpack is run and its output is Rmax, the achieved floating point performance of the limpack algorithm. It's measured in flops per second, floating point operations per second. I will come to that in a minute. Now, this ranking is published twice a year, uh, once in June at ISC in Germany, a conference, and once in November at SC in USA. Um, just to give you some numbers and to, to put these things into perspective. In the first lists, list, which was uh, published in 1993, number one was a connection machine CM5 with 1024 processors. At that time there was no multi-core thing. So one processor was one core, was one chip, was one socket. And this machine had a performance, Rmax for Linpack, of 60 gigaflops. So 60 billion floating point operations per second. Now that's some number. If we go to the current list, June 2020, uh, the current number one is the Japanese Fugaku system uh, made by Fujitsu. It has 7.3 million processors, or to be exact, 7.3 million cores, and a peak performance, sorry, a Rmax performance of 415 petaflops. Quite some ratio here, and if you do the math, you will find out that the, there's a performance increase over those 27 years of 79% per year from 1993 to 2020. Now you might have heard of Moore's law which says that the complexity the number of transistors on a chip doubles about every 24 months and um, usually by some lucky coincidence this changing complexity, this increasing complexity has always translated in a proportional increase uh, in performance. Now if you if you compare that with this observed increase in performance in the list, you will see that the list grows faster than Moore's law. And this is because over the years, parallelism has taken, has, has been responsible for a big share of this acceleration. So Moore's law was well and alive up to now at least, but the increase in parallelism added another factor on top of it. So the list 
performance grows faster than Moore's law. Here two pictures. One of the uh, number one system in 1993, a CM5. If you know the film Jurassic Park, there's one or two scenes with a CM5 in the background that was the leading supercomputer of the day. The lower picture here is the Fugaku system at the Riken Research Center in Kobe in Japan. What is performance? I gave you a performance metric for LINPAC. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. But in general, we have to define what performance actually is in general terms. Now, in computing, just as everywhere else, performance is the ratio of work divided by time. Now, what is work and what is time? Time is simple. With time, we always mean wall clock time. is the time that you can read off the clock in the Einsteinian sense. Okay, this is There's no... No ambiguity here, and don't let anybody tell you there's another concept of time. Just the work clock time. Now, work is a little bit more complicated and diverse. Work can mean flops, floating point operations, multiplies, adds, subtract, divide, probably more complicated stuff. But it could also mean other things, depending on what you're doing. So, for example, if you work on structured or unstructured grids, then your concept of work may be a lattice site update because you're updating data on lattice sites. Uh, or it could be an inner iteration of your solver, if that's the amount of work that you're looking at. Or just solving the problem. If your problem is always the same, same problem size, same structure of problem, same algorithm, then solving the problem is just the number one. So your performance metric is just one over time. All these are viable options for the amount of work. However, even though there's a choice about the amount of work and how we define it, the flop is still quite popular because it's so well defined, at least what people think. We will see later in the lecture that sometimes the flop is not a good metric because it's easily manipulated. But overall, um, it's, it's very heavily used. One flop is a floating point operation. So add, subtract, multiply, or divide on floating point numbers. And flops per second it answers the question, how many flops can be done per second? And the nice thing is you can use the flops per second metric for two things. You can use it to characterize a computer. How fast can a computer possibly compute? How many flops per second can it do? We call that its peak performance. And the other meaning is, how fast does it solve a given problem? using a given program. So how many flops per second does it do as it is running this program? And this is what we see with a LINPAC benchmark, for example. So there are two different concepts here, the actual performance of a running program and the peak performance of a computer. Now, this peak performance depends on many things and especially depends nowadays on the accuracy of the input operands. So you may be aware that there's double float, maybe half precision, maybe other things. Um, so nowadays, typically, not always, but often, the float performance, the single position performance, is twice as high as the double position performance in modern processors. When we look at peak performance of processors, then often the divides are neglected. This is because divides tend to be very slow. They're so slow that they don't contribute a major um, part of the overall performance. So now there's some double precision peak numbers for systems um, to get you orientated in this in this whole sea of numbers. The top 500 range, so from uh, rank 500 to rank 1, is from 2.6 petaflops to 514 petaflops. Okay, so this is the range in which you are when you have a system in the top 500 list. Now, where is a, where's a one CPU system located in this range? If you look at a modern multi-core CPU, like the AMD Rome 7742, this is the processor that is used in the latest um, high-performance system at the University of Stuttgart Federal Computing Center. This processor has 64 cores, and it has a peak performance of 2.3 teraflops. So that's teraflops. It's still a factor of 1,000 below the petaflop regime, which you need to get an entry ticket to the top 500 list, which means you need about, you need more than 1,000 of these ROM processors to get at least into the lower end of the top 500 list. And if you look up the price for such processors, these are high-end server processors, and the price tag is about 6,000 euros for one of those processors. 
which means you need a thousand of them. So there's at least six or seven million euros just for the processors to get a system that can just barely make it into the list. And that's not looking at things like infrastructure, uh, network disks, and so on. So you need a lot of money to get into this list. Your PC at home uh, is a little bit weaker on this side. So it has maybe a, between 100 and 500 gigaflops. There's also um, pretty sure that there's a GPU in it, a graphics processing unit, which can be used for computation. Uh, this is not the topic of this lecture. The GPU can add another half to 10 teraflops, depending on how much money you want to spend. Um, usually the, the normal office and gaming graphics cards that you have in, in PCs, they don't have a lot of double precision performance. They can do very good at single precision, but not at double precision. And your cell phone is also a parallel computer that can do flops nowadays. And the range is here 5 to 50 gigaflops, probably, if you have a very expensive one that may be 50. And remember that the top 500 number one in 1993 had 60 gigaflops. So your cell phone, if you have a modern um, iPhone, for example, can just about compete with the fastest computer in the world 27 years ago. So here's an overview of supercomputing centers in Germany. Well, there's a couple of supercomputing centers and there's us <laughs> in, in Erlangen. Um, so there are three federal centers which um, give their cycles to scientists all over Germany and also in Europe. There's a supercomputer center in Jülich, one in Stuttgart, and one in Garching, uh, near Munich. So the peak performance numbers are indicated here. Uh, in Erlangen, we have two larger production systems with a performance of roughly half a petaflop. So this is really more than order of magnitude below the, the current top systems in Germany, uh, although we will install a larger system next year. So here's the cluster that you will get access to when you do the exercises. It's called Maggi. Maggi, the name comes from the company that installed it. Uh, it's Megware from uh, Chemnitz. And we're very happy that Megware won the, uh, the tender for the system. Uh, it's, it's nice that a German company can compete with international um, competition like uh, Hewlett Packard and others. It has 728 compute nodes in the sense I described before. So 728 systems, each running its own instance of the Linux operating system. Overall, it has 14,560 cores. Each node has 20 cores, uh, and those 20 cores are in two sockets. Each socket is an Intel Xeon with 10 cores and 2.2 gigahertz of clock frequency. We have 64 gigabytes of main memory per node and no local disk. So you see that even though there's a couple more cores and a little bit more memory, the overall architecture is very similar to a desktop PC. There's a little bit more beef, but a little bit more of everything in there. But in general, um, you could just go about and develop a parallel program on your PC at home, then copy it to the supercomputer, recompile it and run it. And more often than not, uh, this will work. The peak performance of the system is a half a petaflop and the Rmax performance, so the performance when we ran Linpack was 0.48 petaflops, which, which gave us number 346 in the November 2016 top 500 list. Of course, we've long since dropped out of the list, and this price tag of 2.5 million euros will not get you an entry ticket to the list nowadays. You will have to spend much more money to get in there. The power consumption, also a very important number, um, is between 120 kilowatts and 210 kilowatts. That depends on the workload. If you run Linpack, which is a really hot code, drawing a lot of power, then you, we, we use about 200 kilowatts. But in, in regular operation, it's more like 150 to 170 kilowatts. Here's a, uh, a protocol of the power consumption of our HPC systems over the last seven days until uh, this noon today. And you see that in the purple part, this is Maggi, and it's pretty constant at about 150 kilowatts. Needless to say that these systems are usually 95 to 98% utilized. So maybe there's a little weekend effect, so on Sunday it drops a little bit. But uh, overall, the, the um, utilization ratio is really good.
So 150 kilowatts, 200 kilowatts, maybe megawatts for bigger systems, that's a big problem because the cost of electrical energy is significant um, in, in our country. So FAU, our university, pays 20 cents, 20 euro cents per kilowatt hour for electrical power, which means if you do the math that one megawatt of power, if you use it for one year, 24-7, 8,700 hours, costs you 1.8 million euros. And if you compare that with the cost of electrical power of a supercomputer, then you end up with the insight that over the lifetime of the computer, which is between five and six years typically, you spend about the same sum uh, for electrical power that you spent for procuring the system, for buying the system in the first place. So this is a major insight. It's really important to know that, that the running the system costs about as much as buying the system. And this, these numbers don't even include the cost for cooling, the overhead for cooling the system, because, I mean, those 200 kilowatts, this is 200 kilowatts of hot air or hot water, and they must be gotten rid of. You have to get rid of this heat. Depending on how you do it, this may be another 5% to 150% of overhead for doing the cooling. A typical server, even if you don't call, uh, don't um, take into account the cooling, costs you thus about a thousand euros per year. Okay, a thousand euros per year just for running stuff, not buying the thing. So here's the top three of the current top 500 list again. And the last column, if you look at the website, uh, gives you the power of the system. And the Fugaku number one has 28 megawatts of power. So with electrical um, energy prices um, as they are in Germany, uh, that's 28 megawatts. Um, and that means it's about 50 million euros they have to spend per year. Now, I don't know about the uh, energy prices in Japan, but I do know about energy prices in, in the US. So other countries do have other boundary conditions. In the US, for industrial large-scale customers, um, electrical power costs about 7 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, That means they have less of a problem. Um, if they need more power for a supercomputer, they just build a power plant. So who cares? Okay, but we should actually, everybody should, because it's also an environmental issue, um, the amount of electrical energy we burn in computers. So this wraps it up for today. Here's some take home messages. Supercomputers are parallel computers. If you don't use, if you don't employ their parallelism, you will not get performance. Your program will be slow. So, Unfortunately, there's no automatic mechanisms involved here. So it's your task to write a parallel code. You have to learn to do that if you need a new implementation, new algorithm. Of course, you can use ready-made programs, parallel programs that somebody else uh, has, has developed. You can also use libraries that are parallel. That's all possible, but that's not the topic I want to teach here. I want to teach you how to write parallel programs yourself. Remember that even your desktop PC is a parallel computer nowadays and that a lot of the development for large-scale parallel computing can actually start at the desktop. You have four or eight cores on your desktop computer, so use them to do parallel computing and to develop parallel programs. The second insight from today is supercomputers are expensive to buy and to run. So if you run something on a supercomputer, Make sure you use the resources effectively. And that's also one of the things I want to teach you here, how to determine, how to make sense of the performance numbers and how to determine whether or not your program is making good use of the hardware.